Taranaki, we went north to see one of the most remarkable places in New Zealand, the celebrated Waitomo Cave. At all the important holiday resorts, there are comfortable hotels or hostels, and Waitomo is no exception. There's first-class accommodation to be had at the guest house right by the cave. These caves are something quite unique even in New Zealand, where nature has been so lavish of beauty and charm. There are delicate fairy-like grottos, galleries of sparkling walls, fantastic arches and gothic pinnacles. The huge vaults of Waitomo are hung with glistening stalactites, as many other caves are in other parts of the world. But at Waitomo is one cave, which the camera can't show you, which is really unique. A huge, silent cavern glowing with the unbelievable eerie radiance of a myriad glowworms. Visitors drift quietly in their boats under an arch of light and gaze up at something they just don't believe, even while they look at it. A strange, uncanny world, this of the cave. The sort of place you might come across in one of the tales of the Arabian Nights. A world of getting and spending, business and politics, all the bustle and confusion of life. It all seems very remote in this eerie, underground kingdom, away from the blue sky and the broad sea. Now from this dream world we go south to the solid reality of a modern city, Wellington, the capital city of New Zealand. It stands at the southernmost end of the North Island on a great sweep of harbour surrounded by hills. This is the nerve centre of New Zealand's life, the place where laws are enacted and government is administered. Apart from being the seat of government, Wellington is also a great commercial and industrial centre. Here in Parliament buildings, the nation's business is done, and because New Zealand is a democracy, this is the most important place in the world, taking its traditions from the mother of Parliament in Western Australia, and standing as the bulwark of democratic freedom. In the open ground in front of Parliament buildings stands the Cenotaph. In the foreground is the statue of Richard John Seddon, the great liberal statesman of half a century. Wellington has grown rapidly during the past few decades and has attained to a full metropolitan dignity. Many modern buildings, including some of the finest hotels in Australasia. The very best in luxury accommodation can be had here, in hotels that are praised by visitors from Europe and America. The Dominion Museum building stands on high ground in the middle of the city. It contains many art treasures and some rare and extensive collections. This huge block of flats is evidence of the progressive building policy followed by the government housing department in recent years. We're standing on one of the hills that enfold Wellington. There are magnificent views all along these hills. This city is still growing, thrusting out into the Hutt Valley to the east, developing new industries, putting up new buildings. Deepwater Harbour is one of the finest assets any city could hope to possess. Fifty miles away, tucked inside the lovely Marlborough Sound, lies the little town of Pitkin. The traveller takes the ferry express and leaves Wellington Harbour to make the journey across Cook Strait, saying farewell to the North Island and taking with him a crown of fresh and vivid memories of the things he has seen. He is about to make his first acquaintance with the South Island, and there he will find himself in a different country, one that becomes more distant from the North Island the further south he goes. Thousands of people come here holidaying to the Marlborough Sound, where land and water are interwoven. Great hills rise out of the soft arms of the sea. At Picton, they make the most of the gift of nature, spending lazy days in the sun, enjoying the calm and sheltered waters they have chosen in their launch. New Zealanders and visitors gather beside the water in the hot sunshine and swim and sunbathe in these quiet inlets where the bush comes down to the water and the songbirds sing. From Picton we go to Nelson, one of the most attractive towns in the Dominion. It stands at the apex of the great V-shaped gulf known as Tasman Bay. 
A sheltered spot chosen a century ago as one of the settlements of the famous New Zealand Company, established by Edward Gibbon Wakefield. No lovelier site could have been chosen. The coastline all around this northern end of the South Island is fabulously beautiful. The Nelson Savour of Watering Place in the summertime is Tahuna Beach, a strip of sand only three miles from the township, where the beach slopes gently and the children romp safely all day. You could hardly imagine Nelson without gardens, both public and private. And the Queen's Gardens, which are close to the business quarter, provide a pleasant interlude for the visitor who takes a stroll. Swans sail through the reflection of trees, breaking the still surface of the water into a pattern of ripple. Nelson people are proud of their colleges, and here we see the boys' school. Nelson College is one of the best known in the Dominion. It's going to have some good men, too. Rutherford House. We live in the age of Adam now, for better or for worse, and this Nelson old boy has a good claim to be called the father of the atomic age. Very proud of Lord Rutherford. They've named one of their schoolhouses after him. His career in the strange and new world of modern physics was as spectacular as that of any scientist of his time. And this portrait hangs in the college as an inspiration for later generations of Nelson lads. There are many fine old buildings in the Nelson district built in days when the English tradition was fresh in the minds of the colonists. Days that were less strenuous than these, when they took time to lay the foundations of New Zealand well and truly. Libraries, churches, public buildings, dwelling houses, and these helped to provide a solid background for the life of the day. These old colonial houses are as sound as a bell. And they have a particular charm about them, which is enhanced by the beauty of their setting. Trees and gardens that have grown round them with the passing of the years. Plants and trees of all kinds thrive in the mild Nelson climate. Day is a riot of colour and evening is full of scents drifting on the gentle air. With the magnolia bloom, the queen of the night presiding over the parliament of flowers. There are many retired people here for nature is kind and the sun warms the cockles of the heart. The Nelson district is the California of New Zealand. In every valley, the sun draws the season on, pouring down vital warmth, building up life and energy in the soil and in all living things. Far away on the horizon are the blue hills that bound this fertile district. And on the valley slopes are acres upon acres of fruit trees, Apples, peaches, nectarines, pears. At one time, gold was the lure that drew men to this coast, but now it's a different sort of gold they look for in Nelson. Gold of the sun, which whitens their fruit, their tobacco, their hops. Nelson has a nearly perfect climate, with more hours of sunshine than any other place in New Zealand. Even in winter, the average is five and a half hours of sunshine daily. Peaches with the bloom still fresh upon them are picked and put into boxes. I don't know how the growers can bear to cut them, but I suppose they get used to sending these wonderful looking things away. Nelson apples are famous all over New Zealand. And many of them find their way to Britain too. If there are apples around, you can be sure that boys aren't far away. I hope they came by the monster. What apples the boys don't eat are packed and sent off to market, where they're always in demand. Long blue summer days, pale golden beaches and the sparkle and glint of waves. Happy days of peace and forgetfulness, when life becomes a dream and time slips through the fingers like sand. These are days to remember in the sadness of winter, when the wind sighs over the hills and life becomes a burden. One of Nelson's biggest industries is hop growing, and I don't need to tell you what the hops are for. Hop vines were originally brought to New Zealand from Kent, but nowadays quite a lot of English beer is brewed with hops imported from New Zealand. They look so attractive it seems a shame to pull them down, 
but down they must come to be picked over by the girls and put in bins. Hop picking is a seasonal occupation, and workers from other parts of the country flock to Milton in the summertime. Quite a few of the girls are university students. Hop picking in the sunshine makes a very pleasant holiday and earns some extra money. Well, here's to the girls who made it possible. I don't mind if I do. Not so very many years ago, New Zealand used to import all her tobacco leaves. Nowadays, there are big plantations in the Dominion. And in Nelson, tobacco growing is a vidile industry, which turns out a high-grade leaf for the manufacture of pipe and cigarette tobacco. Over five million pounds of tobacco are produced in New Zealand every year. The Nelson soil and climate have been found to be ideal for the growing of the wheat. When the leaves are ripe, the job of picking begins. Those leaves at the bottom mature first and are the strongest. So they're taken at the first crop. It's a strenuous business picking tobacco, very hard on the back. The pickers must be careful not to crush the leaves unduly, as they discolour and lower the grade. When you smoke your pipe at ease and comfort, spare a thought for these fellows slogging away under the brazen summer sun, bending and stooping for hours on end. The leaves are carted away to a central depot and passed over to the girls. Like the hop pickers, these girls are university students, improving the shining eye. They take the leaves and string them out on racks for drying. This kind of thing looks fairly simple, but it requires a good deal of dexterity if you're to make any sort of paper. This tobacco growing is a tricky business. Everything has to be done at just the right moment, and that takes good judgment and close watching. Next, the leaves are put in the big kiln and taken a stage further on their journey to the tobacconist's counter. When they come out of this hot shop, they've begun to look like the tobacco leaves in the advertisement. Golden brown leaves carrying with them the promise of peace and content. Cool, fragrant smoke curling up from the pipe bowl, feet on the mantelpiece, and worries forgotten. It's sad to think of all that work going up in smoke, but that's just life, I suppose. There are many spectacular gorges in the mountain country, and one of the most remarkable of them is the Buller Gorge. From Nelson, the road runs for 64 miles along the banks of a great river, beside bush-clad mountains that tower above the highway. The Buller River, by the way, is named after the famous naturalist, whose book on the birds of New Zealand is highly prized by collectors today. It's a long trip through the gorge, so the traveller stops to have a cup of tea out of the circle, or perhaps something a little stronger. And so let his eye take in the scale of this great river valley. At one point on the journey, the road has been hewn out of solid rock, which overhangs the full width of the highway. It's known as Hawke's Crag in the road. A great feat of road making and an indication of the sort of country we're passing through. Through the gorge we went, heading for the west coast, where the wild Tasman beats against a rocky shore. There's hardly a day in the year when a big swell isn't rolling in, bursting on the long beaches, crashing on the rocks and hedges. The day we saw it, it was reasonably calm, but even then there were comas tumbling to shore. One of the first things that struck us was the variety of strange formations. Nature seems to have been in an experimental mood the day she turned the west coast out of her mould. The oddest of all are the pancake rocks, as they're called. There they are, great heaps of them. All we lack now is some maple syrup. Our first glimpse of the southern lakes came as a surprising contrast. Lake Maparita lay there in a crystal dream, dreaming of mountains. Far in the distance and mirrored in the blue serenity is the famous Franz Josef Glacier. A glacier is a river of ice in slow motion. The great valleys of the South Island were carved out in remote ages by glaciers moving down to the sea. And here the process still goes on. The Franz Josef is one of the most remarkable glaciers in the world. 
From a height of 8,000 feet, it descends in the comparatively short distance of eight and a half miles to an altitude of only 700 feet, and its lower portion lies buried in some of the most luxuriant subtropical vegetation to be seen anywhere in the world. It's been compared to a huge flaming jewel in the mountainside, and when you see it, lit with blue and green, mauve and purple light in every rift, a radiance that is as soft and clear as flame itself, when you see the ethereal glow in its caves and hollows, you'll not feel inclined to disagree with that comparison. The Franz Josef drops so steeply that the whole of its trunk is broken with yawning crevasses and enormous ice falls and giant pinnacles. Within its caverns we see the architecture of this planet and its lovers. The Franz Josef Glacier, a thing of strange and lovely beauty. Nearby is the Tasman Glacier, which is 18 miles long. Plenty of room on this for walking and climbing. When you climb to the top of a ridge and look out over the huge panorama of ice and snow, you begin to feel something of the vast scale of this landscape, with its great broken masses and its gigantic rubble of rock and ice. When you're tired of battling with mountains, perhaps you'll descend and make your way to Lake Matheson and let your eyes rest on the peaceful reflections of the giants against whom you've been pitting your strength. Mirrored here on the surface of one of New Zealand's loveliest stretches of water, these mountains look gentle and serene. It's hard to imagine the great winds roaring across the ridges, the snowstorms screaming from the topmost peaks. In the distance, the Fox Glacier descends to 670 feet above sea level, the lowest of any glacier in the world outside the polar region. Here again, the great ice flow moves through an almost tropical richness of color and growth in a valley filled with birds. Southern flakes vary in their range of color. Some are deep blue, others are lovely cerulean. And Lake Tekapo has its distinctive greenish tint. Looking at it through the fringed branches of pines or fir trees, you can almost imagine yourself on the shores of some lake in Switzerland. The old Mackenzie Kirk stands as a monument to remind us today of those early pioneers who settled on these touched plains. From the inside of the church, we look out over a scene that quiets and stills the minds of those seeking inspiration and strength in a lovely house of God. Mount Cook, which the Maori's name are Rangi, the cloud cheers up, towers over 12,000 feet above sea level. The highest and most celebrated peak in New Zealand. Near its foot stands the Hermitage, where people come from all over the world for the winter sports. There are many other imposing peaks in this region, where the great 300-mile chain of the Southern Alps, the spine of the South, South Island, reaches its highest level. The Hermitage is a fine, comfortable place to have a complete rest. But of course, skiing is the main thing. If you don't want to relax, if you feel really tough and energetic, then you take the bus up to the skiing ground. Even if you don't want to go skiing, if you'd rather stand by and watch the other fella take a spill, it's still worth going, just for the sake of getting up high and living for a few hours on the roof of the world with a background of huge snow mountains and glaciers wherever you look and a feeling of peace in your heart, the sort of peace you only dream about back there in town with people milling around you and last month's bills not paid. You'll find yourself in the biggest room in the world, with no doors and no windows and no cooking smell. The day we went to the skiing ground, there was quite a crowd of us. Men and women, some of them expert skiers and others, well, just like ourselves. We made our headquarters for the day at the Ball Hut and lost no time getting out to the big slope. In that crisp mountain air, you don't feel cold, you just feel fit, and about ten years younger. You're going to be tired before the day is out, and it's going to be good to have a hot bath and a drink, then dinner back at the Hermitage, and later to sleep like a log until morning breaks over the mountain peak. But just now you feel as if you could walk for miles and climb anything. Everything is so white, a world of blinding light, 
When you move, you feel it's a sacrilege to put your footprints on the immaculate purity. An immensity of whiteness, except for our long shadows falling on the snow and making caricatures of us. Great walls of whiteness rise around us. It's a stiff climb up, some of these snow slopes, but by the time you've got to the top, your lungs are full of mountain air. There's no thought now in their minds of anything but the thrills to come. The long, sweeping curve downward like the wind, the winding flight down the great snow track, the excitement of speed and rhythm. Somewhere far beyond these dreaming reaches of snow lies the world. There's work to be done, lawns to be cut, gardens to be dug, socks to be darned. But the world and all its worries are forgotten for the moment. Let's watch the fun. A winding track reduces the speed, but adds interest to the run from the skier's point of view. In the background, white mountain walls shine on the brink of heaven. Here is the great Tasman Glacier looming above us, making us feel like animals. Away they go, curving down the gentle slope, just limbering up for a bit of tougher work later on. I don't suppose there's a skiing film ever been made without this being done. Sorry, but we just couldn't resist it. It's much more tricky to do than you'd imagine. Makes the cameraman feel like a croaky boy. Now here's a fine big slope. There'll be some long runs on this. Just watch it. down a breakneck speed, but fortunately there's no need for any neck breaks. When they make an error of judgment, they fall into the kind arms of the snow, which is always waiting to catch them. It's all in the game. There's a wrong way to fall and a right way. You should learn quickly enough. You'll get plenty of practice at the beginning. It must be the most exciting thing in the world to send yourself hurtling down a slope like this with the wind rushing past like a gale, and all that whiteness beckoning below you. Wish I'd got that far, but I haven't got past lesson one. How to stand up without falling flat on my face. Mount Cook isn't the only skiing ground in these parts. Way over at the Skippers near Queenstown, there's first-class skiing to be had. I'm awfully good at this kind of skiing. All you do is hang on to this rope and get yourself pulled up for about 500 feet at a gentle five miles an hour. And when you get to the top, you're ready for the run down at a much greater pace. I actually get up faster than I speed down. Queenstown, on the shores of Lake Wapitipu, is one of the loveliest and most peaceful spots in the country, and a favourite health resort. In the background are the Remarkables, a long, jagged range of mountains rising up several thousand feet. The little township nestles under the hills, with lake water lapping peacefully at its front door. Wapitipu is one of the biggest lakes in New Zealand. It's 50 miles long and covers an area of 114 square miles, something like 1,400 feet deep. The intense blue of the water is due to its depth and clearness. In late summer, the rowan berries make a brave show in Queenstown. Great clusters of them glowing redly against the blue of halcyon skies. The old stone buildings give the township an air of distinction, of beauty and dignity combined. Trips on the lake are very popular with visitors who come to Queenstown. You really need to go on one of these launch excursions to get a proper idea of the wonderful mountain region surrounding this shimmering sheet of water. If it happens to be summertime and you have memories of Queenstown in winter, you'll notice that the Remarkables have lost their white cloak of snow. 
this Queenstown district gets very little rain during the course of the year, so on almost any day in any season of the year, a launch trip like this will store the mind of the traveller with scenes that will linger for a long time. From the lower levels, from the great bluffs to the shoreline, the eye moves up to the distant snow mountains that rise on all sides, peak after peak, range upon range stretching in rugged grandeur for miles. And behind these one knows there are other great mountains, and others beyond them again, deep in a region where very few men have trod. Away up the lake there are sheep stations, lonely places whose only links with the world are the steamer and the radio. The steamer does the long trip on Rocket Dickey. There are well-organized travel services throughout the holiday grounds of New Zealand for day trips as well as longer journeys. Wherever you go in Lakeland, beauty and wonder walk side by side. There are mountains and valleys, rivers that tumble gaily over their rocky beds, and forest glades that lift a beckoning finger to the passerby. In New Zealand, the picnic is an institution. There are plenty of quiet corners in the lake region where a day can be spent idling on the grass or strolling through bush pastures. Boiling the billy is a ritual procedure that simply can't be omitted from any picnic outing. To tell you the truth, a cup of tea is something you'll soon get used to in any part of New Zealand, at any hour of the day at all, you'll find yourself involved in some little gathering where tea drinking is the chief business. There are long days in the sun. And there are other days where the great mists roll up over the mountains and give a new sort of splendor to the scene. Nights to be remembered long after, through the mist of the years. Nights against burning stars. mountains, we moved eastward across the province of Otago and came to its chief city, Dunedin. It's a fine, dignified city, is Dunedin, and its people are proud of their Scottish origin. They like to hear Dunedin called the Edinburgh of the Southern Hemisphere, and they put up a noble statue to Robert Burns. Dunedin has many stately buildings, and like most New Zealand towns and cities, it has plenty of space between the places and the streets are set off with trees to relieve the severity of stone and concrete. There are some very fine libraries in this city. The old Scottish tradition of learning has been carried on. The harbour is surrounded by hills and is sheltered from the Pacific Ocean by a long, narrow peninsula. The foresight of the early Scottish settlers in setting aside both land and money for educational and religious purposes enabled the Otago University to get an early impetus which it has never lost. Dunedin people are especially proud of First Church, which stands in the heart of the city and is a monument to the strength of spirit of its Presbyterian founders. This massive building with its great spire soaring skyward is said to be the finest example of Gothic architecture in the Southern Hemisphere. Paul's Anglican Cathedral is another fine church. Here we see a most curious building. It was put up in 1871 by the Honorable W.J.M. Larnock, and it's known to this day as Larnock's Castle. It was copied from an old Scottish building at simply enormous cost. The interior is Gothic in type, and the corbels of the arches and the ceiling of the inner hall are hand-carved. Carvers worked for 18 years on the ceilings and doors. The glass in every window is double. The hanging marble staircase is quite unique, and marble was used also for the mantelpieces and for the paving of the entrance hall. The 
the ornateness of this building has to be seen to be believed. The motive that led to its erection must have been a very curious one indeed. From the battlemented tower, a remarkable view of anything up to a hundred miles can be obtained on a clear day. Goodbye Dunedin, we're leaving you and taking the road to the west again. But this time, it's the southwest where the great fjords lie. That great region of lakes and mountains and rocky paths and sounds where the sea stretches its long fingers probing into the land. From the northern end of Lake Siano, the Milford Track begins that 32-mile route to Milford Sound that's been called the finest walk in the world. And that's a tall claim to make, but nobody has done this three-day trip through valley and bush as we've heard the challenges. Huge mountain ranges leap towards the sky. In the depths of the valleys lie rivers and pools of water that mirror the emerald light, and great rocky ridges stretch on all sides of it. Gaunt ribs of rock that form the skeleton of this gigantic landscape. Lake Mintaro lies like a jewel in the midst of this valley, its limpid waters shining softly. Our path lies always in the shadow of the great peaks, the dreaming stillness of a lake or pool or the lacy shawl of a waterfall. There are streams to be crossed, detours to be made through a leafy wilderness without a single snake or harmful animal or insect. And our eyes keep turning to those sentinels that stand and watch us as we trust our way below them, encroaching on their solitude. wanders up between the grim walls of the Clinton Canyon with its great turreted crags. Here we find the mountain daisy and a wealth of other alpine flowers. They're so small and so gentle, these flowers, so unobtrusive that we shall have to tread carefully to avoid crushing them under our feet. Here grow the gentians, too, found only in such remote and high places as this. And the mountain lily, which is not a lily at all, but the world's largest buttercup, spreads its broad leaves to catch the dew. The traveller can pick one of these leaves and quench his thirst with the crystal water lying within it. On the heights of McKinnon Pass, 3,400 feet up, you climb to the top of some ridge in this lonely kingdom of the snow god. Gaze long, take it into your mind and store it there. The great valley you have trodden lies open before you, stretching into the remote distance and losing itself in the perspective of mountain range. Two-thirds of the way along the track to Milford, the traveller comes upon the Sutherland Fall, tumbling nearly 2,000 feet to the valley floor, one of the highest waterfalls in the world and one of the loveliest. through a great valley bordered by mountains of rock and brings us at last to the head of Milford Sound where the hostel is waiting for us with open arms and with good food and hot baths and comfortable beds. Behind us towers Mount Kisoko, 9,000 feet high. From the moment we arrived on the shores of Milford Sound, we felt a sense of unreality. The plumes of the toy toy grouse waved against the dancing blue of the water in this fabulous place whose fame has echoed round the world. The launch was waiting for us, and soon we set out on our journey down the sun.
Not far from the shore, we came in full view of the bow and pull. When the rains come, they send a great cloud of spray scattering across the full width of the inlet. Away down at the entrance to the sound, a mist materialized and lay across the water, obscuring the narrow gateway to the sea. These gigantic battlements of rock climbed sheer out of the water for thousands of feet. Milford Sound is over 1,200 feet deep, and the mountains rise to heights of five and 6,000 feet. New Zealand's fjordland is one of the really ancient parts of the world, a giant landscape carved out of granite, crowned with ice and snow. Milford Sound is the most wonderful of all the fjords in this region. When these giant grampus ranged alongside and gave us escort, we felt like Ulysses and his comrades sailing the blue Aegean, with dolphins attending the bows of their ship. The golden light of the sun broke across the peaks, and the pale clouds drifted like thoughts across the surface of our blue. Nature has her monuments, and man too builds great monuments that stand against time and death and assert the primacy of the spirit. Far away on the east coast of the South Island lies the city of Christchurch, and in the heart of Christchurch stands the great cathedral whose spire is a symbol of New Zealand heritage, the heritage of English civilization that was brought to this young land by the early settlers a hundred years ago. In this present century, the youth of New Zealand has crossed the seas to fight in two great wars in defense of European civilization. And nowhere else in this country is one so strongly aware of the close link between this Britain of the South and the older land from which its people sprung. In springtime, the lilacs bloom, and the chestnut trees light their candles against the leafy curtain. Daffodils burst into yellow flame under the fresh green foliage of English trees on the grassy slopes where the Avon River meanders through the city. People go boating in casual and professional style. Everywhere in this city at this season, we are made to think of youth and springtime. And when we look at the economic foundations of the life of these people, we find that the agricultural traditions bound up with England's great past have been transplanted to this new soil. Christchurch is the chief town of Canterbury proper. And the life of Canterbury is built on sheep farming and wheat growing. Out in the country districts behind the city, there are men who live close to the land, tilling this fertile earth and harvesting the golden grain. But men cannot live by bread alone. In Canterbury University, as in the colleges of other New Zealand cities, the youth of the nation carries on that tradition of learning, of the pursuit of the things of the spirit, that is the other great pillar of our world. In perpetual strife against circumstances, and in the perpetual rebirth and renewal of all things, both of nature and of the spirit, our lives are lived out on this earth. New Zealand is a young country, 
compared with America and Britain and the older European lands, its career in the world can hardly be said to have begun. Those rugged spirits who took their courage in both hands and set out from the motherland have built another Britain in the deep south of the world. New Zealand is at the springtime of her youth. The visitor finds a warm welcome in the hearts of New Zealanders and is soon made to feel at home in a country where a friendly informality and a vigorous lust for life characterizes the people of this young nation. They're naturally proud of their country and they're eager to show it to others. It's unique and the standard of living rare in the world today. And into this small southern dominion, smaller than the British Isles or the state of Arizona, is packed variety and surprises, unexpected contrasts, and the beauty highlights of a dozen countries. Wherever he goes, the visitor will find the road lying clear before him, the beckoning road to a lovely land. Here, then, is New Zealand, and the password is that old Maori word, 